Welcome to the Equipping You in Grace podcast. We are so excited that you are joining us for the show today. This podcast aims to explore a biblical life view in a conversational tone. Let's join our host and founder of Servants of Grace, Dave Jenkins, for today's episode. Thanks so much for listening. Welcome back to the Equipping You in Grace podcast. My name is Dave, and I'm the host for this podcast. And with me today, I have the privilege of welcoming Dr. Derek Thomas to the show. Dr. Thomas, welcome back to the Equipping You in Grace podcast, sir. Thank you. It's good to be back. Yes, sir. Uh, well, can you uh, just catch us up on what's been going on the last year or so with, in your life, marriage, ministry, and what are you working on ministry project-wise? Uh, I've been married to uh, Rosemary for 40 40- Two years, things are wonderful. They get better and better each year. Can't imagine uh, being married to anyone else. And uh, I also celebrated my 40th anniversary of my ordination in ministry uh, just a few months ago. I mean, we, we didn't actually celebrate it, but it, we noted it in, in passing. And uh, I, I have the privilege of being the senior minister at First Presbyterian Church in Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, I, I also am a chancellor's professor for uh, Reformed Theological Seminary and a, and a Ligonier Fellow, uh, teaching fellow um, for Ligonier Ministries. And um, so life is... Um, it's busy. Yes. Well, congratulations on 40 years of ordained ministry. That's that's definitely a testimony to the grace of God, I know, in your life and, and on 42 years of marriage as well. Uh, congratulations on both of those things. Thank you. Uh, can you please tell us a little bit about uh, your book, John Calvin, for a New Reformation, you edited with John Tweetdale, and that you contributed to? Why did you put this together, and how do you hope it'll be received? Yes, this is a hardback, 600-page uh, uh, book. It's a you know it's a significant size and it's beautifully produced by Crossway. They did a fabulous uh, job. This book has been in publication. Well, it's been in the works for over a decade. You may recall in 2009 it was the uh, 500th anniversary of John Calvin's birth. Uh, he was born in 1509, and uh, this book was intended for that anniversary in uh, 2009. And if you've ever tried to edit a book, uh, a multi-authored book, herding uh, authors is a bit like herding cats. And uh, we had a couple of uh, contributors whose names w- will not be recorded, who were late in uh, supplying their chapters. Closer and closer we got to the deadline, and then we got past the deadline. By that time, there must have been 25 or 30 books already on the market celebrating Calvin. Many of them were very, very fine books indeed. And uh, Crossway and together with John Tweedle and myself, uh, you know, we decided maybe this is not the best time to publish this book since we were still waiting on a couple of chapters anyway. And frankly, I had almost forgotten all about it until uh, about a year ago, Crossway uh, picked it up again and said, you know, 10 years later, we think there's an, an opening in the market for a book on John Calvin. Uh, and, and it's now out and it's called John Calvin for a New Reformation. Uh, a couple of things about it. Uh, first of all, all the proceeds are going towards uh, African Bible College. So, so this is not anything uh, that will uh, benefit my my pension in any way. Uh, but we were glad to make sure that the proceeds go to African Bible College in U- Uganda. We also managed to get uh, Dr. Spruill, R.C. Spruill, to write an afterword. Uh, of course, we want uh, we didn't realize at the time when we knew his health was declining. But it's um, wonderful that we managed to get that done, and he managed to write that before he went on to uh, glory um, a year ago. Uh, I, I'm I'm just very pleased with this uh, book and the way it's turned out. Yeah, that that is wonderful that R.C. Uh, Dr. Sproul, excuse me, uh, wrote wrote uh, the afterword. And uh, do you want to say a little bit more about why you um, are are uh, dedicating the uh, proceeds to um, African Bible College? I believe it was. It, it was in part because um, it, it's always difficult for an editor of a multi-volume book 
to receive dues. I mean, not not that publishing books produces a whole lot of money, but I, I, I would feel a little awkward taking money for something, but I didn't, you know, I, I, I contributed a couple of chapters in it, but it just didn't feel right for, for us to sort of take the proceeds. So we decided that all the proceeds should go to the African Bible College. And it was in part John and I's uh, concern for uh, theological uh, education in uh, the African continent. So we were we were very happy to um, to do that. And the African Bible, I say African Bible College, but it's now African Bible University in Uganda, uh, was led by uh, Paul Chinchin, who we both knew personally from our time in Jackson, Mississippi, and more recently, of course, by uh, O. Palmer Robertson as the vice chancellor. And Palmer ha- has now returned to the United States, but he devoted maybe 20 years of his life and ministry to teaching in uh, Africa. We wanted to try and help that. No, oh, that's that's just wonderful. I just like to hear those kind of things, and I know our audience does too. Just, you know, there's a lot of things that are going on in Africa, and that's uh, something that we can definitely give thanks to God for, and I'm thankful that you're, you're dedicating the proceeds to uh, help the ministry there in Uganda. So, praise the Lord. What, what role has Calvin's Institute played in the history of Reformed thought. It has played and continues to play uh, possibly the most significant role of any published book apart from the Bible. I mean, there are, there are landmarks, I think, in church history where books have impacted uh, theology and the course of theology considerably. And uh, among those uh, would be Augustine's writings uh, and Thomas Aquinas's writings possibly Jonathan Edwards or John Owen, one thinks of, but but Calvin, more than anyone, uh, has shaped the theological discourse in Reformed theology uh, for the last half a millennium. And uh, it continues to do so. Uh, It would still be a set text for, you know, most Reformed seminaries, most Presbyterian uh, and Baptist of a conservative nature, you know, are going to interact with Calvin uh, at, at some point in their studies. Calvin's, you know, vast output, not, not just the institutes, but his tracts and treatises and his letters and his commentaries uh, and the numerous uh, sermons uh, that are extant uh, by, by Calvin. And that corpus of material uh, consists in roughly 60 large volumes uh, of material and uh, the study of that material uh, still occupies a considerable place in uh, the theological discourse today. Yeah, that, that's really helpful. Uh, for for those who maybe haven't read the Institutes before, what what edition do you like? Like, do you like the Battle Edition or do you like uh, the Banner of Truth Edition? Which which one do you like the most? Well, the Banner of Truth Edition is the f- translation of the French edition from fifteen forty one forty two, and you have to realize that it's half the size of the final edition, the fifteen fifty nine edition. So, if you've never read the Institutes, I think that 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 fifteen forty one edition, the French edition in in English, of course, that the banner produced uh, a few years ago is a good starting point. If you're going to study Calvin seriously, you have to you have to read the final volume because it, it's twice the length. Uh, the Battles edition is, is probably the best one in terms of the footnotes and the indices uh, that, that they provide for you. Though it's not necessarily the best translation, uh, to be honest. There, there are some prejudice, prejudicial translations in the Battles edition. Battles was Battles was Bartian, I think, and and you you sense that sometimes in uh, some some of the translations and some of the older like the Allen 19th century Allen translation is a better it reads better uh, the flow of language is, is, is better he was a better Latin scholar I think but it's the battles text that I would set my students to read okay that's that's really uh, that's really helpful uh, kind of a similar question for for those who haven't read the Institutes before what can they expect to find as they read this uh, great work yes and if you're coming at it uh, cold, it's going to be a difficult book 
uh, to be sure, to read from cover to cover. It, it's a book that is out of proportion uh, in so many respects because Calvin kept adding to it and he added to it according to whatever was, was being discussed at the time. And so there are sections of it that are actually quite brief and then there are sections of it that are extremely lengthily covered. And it would be a mistake to draw the conclusion that the, that the brief parts are, are sort of less important than the longer parts. But what it's saying is that the brief parts were not under debate. There was no, there was no argument, there was no discussion between Calvinists and Lutherans or between the Reformation and Catholicism or, or humanism or, or whatever the issue was. So something like um, election and predestination Destination, although it's not extensive in the institutes, but it, it, it does have a, a lengthier treatment than perhaps the doctrine itself um, warrants. Or, or the section on the church is, is very long, but that's because there was a great deal of discussion on uh, the nature of the church and go church government and church offices and, and, and so on. And I, and I think that I think that the first time reader needs to uh, perhaps read certain sections of it first. And I personally would would say go to book fifteen you know, and, and it comes in four books. I mean, it's divided into four sections and those sections are called book one, book two, book three, book four. And I think the easiest one of all to read is probably book Book three, and and you'll get a sense of Calvin's um, style. Now Calvin was a preacher, and and he was a remarkable preacher, uh, and you can sense when you're reading the Institute the rhetorical uh, flow, uh, and and there are there are sections in his writing where if you read it out loud, you can almost hear somebody preaching uh, in in the rhetoric. Uh, that's coming out. There, there are also guides to the institutes that help you uh, that help you see the sort of structure. Because, as I said, the, the structure is a little complex, and it can throw you unless you're familiar with it. I think my advice is, you know, come at it through book three first. Yeah, that's that's really a really a helpful answer. Um, how how has the institute shaped you personally? You know, you've spent a considerable amount of time clearly in in the Calvin's work. Well, I first encountered it uh, probably forty five years ago um, when I was in seminary, and I found it a difficult book as a, even as a seminary student, and I still have uh, comments in the margins where. I obviously didn't understand or or at certain times objected to some of the things that Calvin said. And then it was, I mean, I mean, during my PhD was in Calvin and his understanding of the book of Job that I really had to sort of immerse myself in the totality of Calvin's output. And without a doubt, I, I regard him as, you know, the most important and the most influential theologian uh, and and he wasn't just a theologian he was a he was a pastor scholar and there is as much output in Calvin in his preaching and sermons as there is in his theological writings and they actually complement each other so for me personally I, I mean he he has shaped the course of my life for the last uh, 50 years continues to do so and I still find myself uh, trying to understand some of the things that he's saying and, and not and not just what he is saying but but how he is saying it uh, and, and his and his grasp of the totality uh, of theology is is quite amazing and and that uh, 500 years later con you know he's continuing you you, you, you can't avoid him you, you even if you disagree with him you 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 have to uh, you you have to face him uh, at some point. Yes, yes, that's that's really well said. Well, you were you were just talking about uh, the Book of Job. Why why is it significant that Calvin viewed the Book of Job as a book about the doctrine of providence? The Book of Job, I think, for Calvin was immensely significant, and and in part because 16th century life, you know, was difficult. 
Calvin himself had experienced loss, the loss of his wife and child. And I think, uh, although there's a lot of evidence that he was interacting with Job uh, before that event, I think that that event sparked in him a desire uh, to study Job further. And then in 1554, uh, you know, the Savitas affair is on the horizon, and he launches into a weekday sermon series where he's preaching uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday at lunchtime on one week and then Wednesday of the following week. And for 14 months from February uh, in 1554 to April in 1555, uh, he works his way through the book of Job, uh, preaching 159 sermons. And all of these sermons, by, by this time, the city uh, employed a stenographer uh, to take down every word that he said. Cowan didn't have any notes when he was preaching. So uh, Dennis Rugunier took down all the all the sermons in shorthand and then they were published. Uh, they were written up in longhand and published in uh, in French and then translated uh, later after Calvin's death. They were translated into English. It, it's a, in part, you know, Calvin's view of the Christian life, uh, that life in this world you shall have tribulation, that it is through many tribulations that we enter the kingdom of God. And Calvin saw something, I think, in Job, that the book of Job wasn't really about Job. It was actually a book about God and about the majesty of God. Uh, and, and I think that's a very profound uh, thought for Calvin, that although Calvin can publish uh, 60 volumes worth uh, of stuff about God, at the end of the day, what we know about God is only a very a very little amount. And, and, there's, and there's still much about God that we don't know and, and cannot understand. And I think that for Calvin was one of the markers uh, in how, how to understand the Bible, that there is a limit to what you can know. And beyond that limit, all you can do is gasp in awe and worship at the sheer magnificence of God. Yeah, I think that's really good. I mean, he, he opens his institutes seemingly in the same way as you say about the knowledge of God and of ourselves. That that kind of flows with what you just said about Job and, and Calvin. Calvin's uh, teaching on on uh, on that book. So you know, in his very first sermon uh, on Job, he says something, and I'm I'm quoting now from memory, but he says it is a it is a great thing to be subject to the majesty of God, and that's the that's the opening sermon on on Job. That you know, none of Job's questions were ever answered, and, but it wasn't important that Job understood. What was important was that God understood, and that you trusted Him. That's not a that's not a small thing. Um, as we're, as we're about to to talk about uh, here in this question. Um, how does the providence of God help Christians to learn patience and to grow in the grace of God? Well, to have a robust doctrine of providence means that, you know, providence is from the Latin pro video, meaning that God sees beforehand. And providence, the doctrine of providence says that nothing happens without God willing it to happen and without God willing it to happen in the way that it happens and before it happens. And, and therefore that all the details of life, uh, from microcosmic issues to macrocosmic issues, are all in God's hands, and, and that we can trust Him. It's it's the Romans eight twenty eight umbrella that we have uh, over us all the time. That uh, God works all things together for the good of those who love Him. So you know, and, and all things work together for good, and and that includes bad things and evil things and things we wish would not take place, but. They too are weaved together in a, a, a way that ensures that we will be brought home to glory. For Calvin, and he has a magnificent section on providence uh, in Book One of the Institutes. For, for Calvin, the doctrine of providence is, is what keeps you sane uh, as you face trials and hostility and, and difficulty. Yeah, that's that's really well said. I was just thinking as you as you talk about that providence helps us to to be still and know that God is is God and that he's he's good and and we can uh trust him and you know as the psalms talk about wait on him um because he's God and he's good um he's not uncaring or distant um he's instead near and and he loves us and he cherishes us we're the apple of his 
by, um, again, you know, psalm imagery. And that's good. We can trust him and delight in him. And that's amazing. Yes, exactly. There are no, there are no, uh, you know, on your cell phone, you have, you have, you have a drop call zone. Uh, there's no, there's no, instead of having five bars, you only have one bar or no bars at all. Uh, but in Providence, there's always five bars, uh, wherever you are and whatever circumstance you're in. And therefore, um, it's the only way to be absolutely assured that no matter what, uh, nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Why is it so crucial to understand the fatherly love of God in the midst of our various trials as Christians. You know, it's an interesting thing uh, that um, Calvin, I don't think, had a great relationship with his father and his father died while he was still studying law at, at university and uh, his father didn't want him to become uh, a preacher or, or a priest as Calvin thought he was going to be uh, but wanted him to become a lawyer. But one of the remarkable things I think in the Institutes and you you see it also in his sermons is just how often Calvin refers to the fatherhood of God that he had a profound grasp uh, Calvin was Trinitarian of course um, but he, he did understand the calculus of how we relate to God that we come to our Heavenly Father through the mediation of the Son and by the help and strength of the Holy Spirit but first and foremost the one that we address is our Heavenly Father and I th- I think that grasping that, um, and it isn't, it isn't always grasped even by conservative, you know, Christians who sometimes are, are more Jesus-centered than they are Trinitarian-centered. Uh, in, in, you know, Calvin had a great assurance that Christians come into a relationship of sonship uh, and adoption and, and meet the Heavenly Father. You know, it's important in, in our understanding of salvation that, you know, we don't represent that as Jesus trying to win a reluctant father's um, love for us, that, that the biblical emphasis is that, you know, God the Father so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, so, so that the initiation of redemption begins not with Jesus trying to win over his father, but the initiation begins with the father sending his son. And that that's a very profound and important emphasis in uh, Calvin. Yeah, you, you touched on something that, that hits home for me because uh, until I was 16, my dad was around, but he was very distant. And um, so I had a very wrong view of, of God the Father. I, I, I was saved at the age of five. And, but when, when that happened, um, you know, God, uh, b- b- before that happened, the Lord convicted me of unforgiveness and bitterness towards my dad. And, and we took a walk and um, I, 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 I said, you know, this is what God's doing in my life. And, you know, we're both Christians and I, I'm, I'm sorry for, for that. And he said he was sorry too. And, and we were immediately, because of the Lord's sovereign grace, reconciled to each other. And uh, we we have had a strong relationship ever since. And it's meant so much to me um, because it's helped my my view of of God's care and and love, knowing that He doesn't, uh, He's not He's not distant, as we as I said before, He's He's near to me and He loves me. He, as you said so beautifully, He's adopted uh, the children of God and. Um, we're, we're sons of God and it, it does affect, it does affect young men it, when, um, especially in particular, not that it doesn't affect daughters too, but it affects men, young men in a, in a significant way in that it affects their view of, of God the Father, as you said so well. Um, what role did friendship play in the life and ministry of John Calvin? Well, that's an interesting question. You know, it, it, it's, uh, it's something that I sometimes ask uh, my students when I teach a course on Calvin, you know, who would you like to have lunch with, Calvin or Luther? You know, I think the answer would be Luther, because Luther would be way more fun uh, uh, than Calvin. But, uh, you know, Calvin's personality was probably fairly austere. I, you know, I can't imagine Calvin telling a joke, but you can, you, could, you know, only can imagine, but you can, you can read some of Luther's jokes. Uh, and I think they were very different personalities. But Calvin did have, I, I mean, first of all, Calvin Calvin didn't have time for friends in one sense. Um, there weren't enough hours in the day for Calvin to work. So from early in 
in the morning until very, very late at night. Calvin was working. He, you know, he, was, he preached every day. Uh, and uh, he studied in the morning, preached at lunchtime. Uh, he had letters to write, books to write, uh, tracts and treatises. He was involved in theological discourse. He was writing to uh, people all over Europe. Uh, people were coming to Geneva all the time and visiting him and so on. So, so and he had a church to run. Um, so, you know, there, there wasn't much time, and there's absolutely no evidence whatsoever of Calvin doing anything recreationally. And the story about Calvin playing bowls on Sunday is not true. Uh, that was an invention after Calvin had died by uh, anti-Calvinists to destroy his reputation. But uh, he was, uh, in, in the book, uh, Bob Godfrey has written a wonderful chapter on Calvin and his friends, possibly now almost 100 years ago, Richard uh, Stauffer, the great uh, Calvin scholar uh, wrote a book on the humanity of Calvin. You know, Calvin had friends like like Philip Melanchthon, although he only actually met him twice, uh, but in correspondence, uh, you know, Bullinger and, and, and his successor, Baser, I mean, they were, they were friends. But his two closest friends were Farrell, Gwilym Farrell, and Pierre Beret. These two, uh, he's in company with these two fairly often, but in the letters especially, and in, you can see it in the dedications of his books, uh, uh, just, just how close he was to Farrell and uh, and Derrett. And Farrell was was much older than Calvin, and, and and again a very different personality. But I think um, I think friendships were important to him. But they were they they weren't the sort of friendships where you hang out with someone and and you know have a drink with someone, a cup of coffee or something with someone, and and ch and chit chat. That, I don't think Calvin had those kinds of friendships. These were these were very much the kindred spirit of fellow reformers, you know, with a task to uh, reform the church in Europe. And it was a, a sort of vocationally driven friendship, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, I was just, uh, it does, it does. I was just thinking he, he was so very intentional. And as you just said so well, he, he didn't have much time. So, you know, he didn't fool around and, you know, he was just very focused and, and that bled over into his friendship and being very intentional. So, do we do we need more men like John Calvin? Yes, I mean, part of the reason for publishing this book, and we gave it the title for uh, a new reformation, and it's in part uh, what the afterward by Dr. Sproul uh, is saying uh, that five hundred years later, you know, we need as much of a reformation in the church uh, today uh, as was needed in the sixteenth century. We're facing different issues and it's not Catholicism so much that we're facing anymore. It's the drift uh, and, and humanization of evangelicalism uh, that uh, requires a reformation and a reformation uh, in uh, truth and doctrine and in our understanding uh, of, of the most basic doctrines um, is under criticism today. Yeah, we need, we need, we need somebody, we, we need people like, and we do have great minds uh, alive uh, today who, who are robust. Um, I, I think that one of the things that perhaps is, is a little different is, is just the sheer, you know, Dr. Sproul himself, you know, was Calvin-like in that he had a great grasp uh, of theology. He was a leader of men. He wrote uh, voluminously, uh, but he was also a preacher uh, and, and a communicator. So yes, we need, and we, we miss Dr. Sproul enormously today, but uh, that legacy of his, and, and God God can raise up these people, but it's uh, my prayer that you know we would see uh, another reformation in our time. Amen. What, what would such men like Calvin look like in terms of their Christian life and ministry? Well, as, as I've been saying, I think I, I, I think that the model here, and, and it was very much the model of the Reformation, that they were they were pastor scholars. Uh, the, these these reformers, you know, like Luther and, and Calvin, the, the magisterial reformers, they were all preachers. Uh, they were communicating essentially with you know lay folk and Calvin uh, in his preaching is I mean his preaching style is is very simple and basic. There are very few big words in Calvin's uh, sermons. They were meant for ordinary 
ordinary people. I think that that's where we should look for um, the Calvins of uh, today or tomorrow. Uh, is not not in the seminary so much, but in uh, but in the in the pulpit. Yeah, that's really good. Uh, where can people go to find out more about your work online, on social media, or otherwise, sir? I have absolutely no idea because I don't do social media. I detest it. I understand that there there are some stuff out there, but but uh, mo- most uh, I mean our church website I have, will will have my my preaching. Ligonier uh, will broadcast uh, my preaching from time to time. Yeah, I'm I'm you know I'm a child of the fifties, so I'm, I struggle with um, you know the the social media side. I, I I get my interns to do that for me. Hey, at least at least you're willing to get help and uh, and and uh, still still use it a little bit. So I can understand that. Well, there's a lot that we haven't talked about in the course of this interview, Dr. Thomas. And as we just wrap up, do you want to give a few takeaways for our listeners? Yes. And, uh, and I think that, you know, publishing a book or in this case, editing a book, you know, I still believe in the value of uh, books, that books can change lives. I, I think that Christians, you know, should from time to time endeavor to read something substantial and not, you know, and not just simple things and, and, and they have their place and function but every now and then I think we need we need our minds sort of challenged and reshaped and recalibrated picking up a good book to read uh, can help us grow and and mature uh, so that that would be my put it on your Christmas list to get a good book to read good Christian book to read that's a really good uh, really good piece of advice and I just want to say touching on what you said I, I just so appreciate that you write challenging and and very good things uh, for for the body of Christ uh, to to grow in and in, in, in their understanding of sound doctrine so I very much appreciate mm-hmm. that sir well thank you so much for having me uh, on your podcast today it's a it's a privilege always to have you on sir and pray Christ's richest blessings on your work thank you so much thank you so much for listening we hope that you were encouraged by today's episode don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review wherever you get your podcast for more uplifting and thought provoking content please visit us online at servantsofgrace.org You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Servants of Grace and on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Servants of Grace. We hope you have a blessed day and we will see you next time.